Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the SDI Group Investor Presentation relating to its final results for the year ending 30th of April 2020. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investment Company dashboard. I'd also like to remind you uh, that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand over to Mike Creedon, CEO, and John Abel, CFO of SDI Group. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mike Creedon, CEO of SDI. I'm assuming that we both have both shareholders and non-shareholders at the meeting. So I'll do a short introduction about SDI. Any further information, could I direct you to the website or our email address at info at scientific digital imaging. And by the way, that comes directly through to me. SDI is an aim quoted group specializing in the acquisition and development of companies that design and manufacture digital imaging products and also sensing and control products for use in science, technology and medical applications. SDI was floated in December 2008 as a vehicle to buy and build. In the early days, it had its problems, but we have now turned the business around. From February 2014, we started to acquire businesses. Today, we have acquired 11 businesses using equity, internally generated cash, and also debt. The game changer for SDI was in October 2015 when we acquired Centec for two million pounds, which was four times profit before tax. We raised two million eight per share, attracting EIS and VCT funds. We are now trading at, I think, about 58, 59 per share. And my, I'm pleased for, with this result. For me, I see an important function of my job as the CEO or even as a director of SDI to create shareholder value. But with that in mind, let's go through the presentation. Oh, I can't find. So if you go on to page three, and it's the board of directors. Over the years, my chairman Ken Ford and I have strengthened the board by recruiting a CFO and non-executive directors with relevant experience to enable the business to grow also to make sure that the executives adhere to the aim corporate governance, which is becoming increasingly important to investors. We have provided detailed bios of the executive directors and non-executive directors, which you can read at your leisure. So if we move on to page four, the agenda, what we'll cover today in this hour is the group overview, highlights, case studies, financials, and right at the end, a summary and outlook. Moving on to page five. John will give a quick overview of the sectors he introduced in our reporting, but any detail behind the business units within these sectors, i.e. all the, uh, the eight business units you can actually see on that graph, can be found in the appendices at the back of the presentation. So John and I won't be going into a lot of detail with these uh, subsidiaries, but we're mainly focused on uh, and results for this, uh, for this period. So if we move on to page six, I'll hand over to uh, my colleague, John. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. This is John Abel. I'm CFO of uh, Scientific Digital, formerly Scientific Digital Imaging, now SDI Group. So uh, what we're showing here at the top, two graphs showing the six year track record from 2015. This year, we've added an extra bar to the right of each one, and we've tried to fit it as, bit, as well as possible to the, the preceding trend. The, uh, it's always been, for the last six years, upwards and, and further to the right, so everything's really on track still. Really strong financial growth since about 2015, with annualized sales growth over that period of 29%. And profit before tax adjusted 66% growth. Now you can see the top right that uh, both our adjusted profit before tax and cash generated from operations this year only grew by 44%, so a bit behind the historical trend. But we, we, uh, we, we do our best to keep up 
uh, the, the growth rate. Business has made 11 acquisitions since January 2014. Uh, what Some of them we buy and keep them a standalone unit, and others we try to integrate with existing units. So that of the 11 acquisitions made and the, the two businesses that existed before them, we now have eight businesses. And that's eight businesses with eight factories and eight general managers or, or general management teams. And that's how we largely see them. The segments that you saw on the previous slide are for reporting purposes and uh, they're because they share certain characteristics amongst them, so digital imaging and sensors and controls. But at a management level, we're interested in the eight different businesses. On the, the graph on the bottom right shows the share price performance, which hasn't really been uh, this year as good as uh, the, the profit increase, but we're aiming to do something about that over time. I think uh, it's popped up a little bit since we, uh, since we released the results. I'm gonna move on to slide seven, which tell, which, I'm gonna just go back there, it's probably my fault. Slide seven, yes, yeah, which shows the highlights from this year's uh, income statement. So revenue increased 41%. Organic growth was about 4%, so 3.7%. The rest from acquisitions, uh, and these were the acquisitions of 2019. Five Stream International, Thermal Exchange, and Graphical Optics, Graphical Optics and MPB Industries, and also the contribution from Chell Instruments the business we bought in November of 2019, so in this financial year. Adjusted profit before tax increased by 44%. Um, uh, so not quite as much as the, the 60% of uh, previous years on average, but still a, a quite a decent increase given the COVID-19 pandemic hit in March and April. Adjusted diluted earnings per share, and we adjust by removing for this purpose reorganization costs, acquisition costs, the amortization of acquired intangible assets, and share-based payments. Adjusted diluted EPS increased 20, actually, 21%. Actually, I think the slide says 23%, but it was 21%. Now, that's lower than it might have been because we had a particularly high tax rate this year because we had to move all of our um, our deferred tax balances to 19%, whereas they'd previously been at 17%, which was the government's published forward rate. Last year, actually, they went they it went the other way. So the growth without that impact would have been about 30% this year. And that's really my favourite measure of our financial performance because it shows what what uh, what cash or cash profits we're delivering per share to our shareholders. Cash generated from operations also increased 44% this year, and we finished the year with net debt at 4 million, compared with last year at 1.5 million. And obviously the biggest difference, and we'll see that in a few moments, was uh, the 5.2 million of cash spent on the acquisition of Chell Instruments. I'm going to move you on to slide eight, and Mike's going to take this one. Uh, one area where our institutes of investors have, have uh, sort of questioned us uh, quite heavily. I think everybody's interested in this as it's uh, sort of the current topic. Uh, this slide has caught a lot of detail in it, which is hopefully self-explanatory, but I'd like to highlight a few points um, just ad hoc on, the, uh, on where we are. All business units remained open throughout this period with a number of staff, especially sales and admin, working from home. We furloughed about 17% of our staff, which is about, I think, 43, 44 staff. But they have gradually bringing the staff back onto sites now, which is probably just a couple of days a week. I'm afraid to say that there are casualties. There are a number of roles within the group that will become redundant. But as we have seen in the press, this is not a surprise, as a number of companies have taken this action. 
One of the biggest concerns myself and John at the start of the pandemic was cash burn. Cash is king in, uh, in all businesses. So what we did was introduced a 13-week rolling cash flow forecast, reporting weekly into our board of directors. But we realized very quickly that the forecasts we were showing uh, were cash generative throughout this period, and we still remain today a cash generative business. This pandemic has generated a high demand for products within two of our businesses. The first one is MPB Industries, based in East Peckham in Kent. And the second one is Attic Cameras, uh, which is uh, based in Marlborough near Norwich, and also a second site, a manufacturing site, just outside Lisbon in a place called Santa Iria. MB, MPB was part of the Ventilated Challenge UK Consortium. I don't know if you've seen it on the news. And it comprises of Penland, a current customer of ours, who were head of the consortium, but also with a number of other members, including Ford and McLaren. Our function, we were, we were due to provide flow meters that would be incorporated within the 15,000 ventilators. This was a steep learning curve for MPV with a headcount of probably 20 staff, as we had to produce 30,000 flow meters for these ventilators, i.e. two flow meters for each ventilator. So we had to increase our output from 150 flow meters per day to a peak of 500. In the presentation, uh, you'll see as we go through, it says an average of 300, but peaking at 500. With the help of Ford and a dedicated MPV workforce, working sort of six days a week between 18 and 12 and 18 hours a day, we achieved this output. And the order was fulfilled at the beginning of July. So now they are back to their uh, normal, normal processes and their normal output. The second one I'd like to highlight is Attic Cameras, which has developed a camera that will be incorporated into a real-time PCR machine to detect SARS, COVID-2, which is the cause of COVID-19. <coughs> we will start shipping this camera during this month. So it's, it's very short. You can see within this uh, presentation, there are a number of bullet points here, but they're the ones to highlight. And uh, if we move on to page nine now, I'll pass you over to John, who will actually discuss the sector, the uh, segment financial highlights. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So, uh, as I said, we've divided our, our business for reporting purposes into two segments. First one, digital imaging, which was the original core of the business. The turnover up uh, 11 million to 11 million from 9 million last year an increase of 17%. The organic sales growth, so growth of uh, businesses that were there for, for the same months of both years was 2.3%. Obviously that was uh, was reduced in, at the end of the year in March and April because of the pandemic uh, developing. So without that, it would have been in the higher single digit uh, level. The rest of the growth was from the acquisitions in 2019 of Graticules Optics and Fivestream, which had a full year with us this year. Gross margin increased in this business from 63% to 67%. That most of that was just due to the incorporation of Graticules Optics, which has a higher margin than, than our typical average. Uh, but there was also some favorable impact of, of exchange, especially towards the end of the year. Our adjusted operating profit, so before reorganization costs, acquisition costs, share-based payments, and amortization of acquired intangible assets, was up to 2.4 million. That's about 20% up from the previous year. Our centers and control businesses increased their revenue by 68%. And again, organic growth was 5.3%, would have been in the high single digits, uh, level without the impact of uh, the pandemic in March and April. And we had particularly strong sales from our uh, Astles, ATC, and Centec units. On top of that, we had good, good contributions from the acquisitions in 2019 and also from Shell Instruments purchased in November 19. Margin in this business, in this segment, decreased from 71% to about 68%. And again, the biggest uh, uh, change there was, was due to mix, 
with Chell Instruments having a slightly lower margin on average than our other businesses because it has a, a, a distributorship business which have uh, lower margins but also lower costs. Adjusted operating profit increased to 3 million from 2.2 million. That's about a 36% increase. And the highlight outside of the financials was the acquisition of Chell Instruments in uh, November 2019. Oh, that's it. These uh, two pages are case studies we're going to include within the annual report. And, uh, a lot to discuss, but it's just to show what SDI as a group do uh, in the buy and build process. So today uh, we're looking at sort of uh, on page 10, it's uh, two areas. First of all, investment, and the second one is collaboration. Let's discuss investment first. Uh, the CEO of Attic Canvas has done a remarkable job in growing this business over the years, and we are now on our fourth relocation. So the first site, when I first joined 10 years ago, we were at 47 square metres, and now we've just moved into another site at 720 square metres. So this unit will give us an opportunity to continue to grow the business. When we were looking at sites uh, recently, we had an opportunity to move into a business park within central Lisbon, uh, very close to Nations Park. But our staffing, who we wanted to continue to work with us, still remain in Santa Maria. So what we've actually done is remained within this area. So the new unit is no more than I would have thought two mile from the uh, the old sites. So uh, we wanted to keep our staff on board because they do a, a terrific job for us in uh, manufacturing the cameras. The second area, which is the picture on the, the right, the oblong box, that is a Synoptics uh, brand, which is Synge the Syngian brand, and it's a gel documentation system. That system uses an attic camera. 90% of the systems we send out to the door use an attic camera. And those, why I wanted to, uh, to sort of highlight that is that's the, the area where attic's main revenue stream from is from, not Synoptics, but from the OEM side of the camera business. The next page, if we can move on to page 11, uh, we've already discussed that under the COVID, but I just wanted to show you some pictures of what we actually tried, uh, what we are manufacturing. So you can actually see in the bottom left-hand corner, MPB flow meters. So it's a, it's a glass tube, and two of those are incorporated into a pendulum ventilator, which you can actually see uh, in the foreground. Those, are those uh, pendulum ven ventilators were actually assembled within the Ford factory and also Airbus, Airbus and then they were tested and boxed and sent out from Penland uh, in Oxfordshire. So if you'd like to move on to the next page, onto page 12, and then from page 12 through to page 16, John will take you through the financials. Okay, so we're looking at the income statement. I'm not going to go line by line through this, just to highlight that organic growth overall was 3.7%. We've already said that somewhat influenced by the COVID-19 pandemic in, towards the end of our financial year. Um, IFRS 16 muddies the water a little bit, not so much on the income statement, where the impact was, was just £41,000 favourable on the operating profit line, and then £82,000 negative on the financing costs line. But it had a bigger impact on the balance sheet. Overall, as you can see, we've mentioned it before, adjusted diluted earnings per share finished 21% up. Again, that's influenced by the tax rate in particular, which was high, but of deferred tax rather than actually cash tax. Moving on to uh, a bridge from last year's profit, adjusted profit before tax to this year's. See, we started last year with three million pounds of adjusted PVT. The biggest uh, bar on here was the additional profit from the entities we acquired both in 2019 and in 2020, plus 1.3 million. And then our existing businesses added another 0.9 million of, uh, of gross profit. Of course, that is where we were hit by the pandemic towards the end of the year. So without the pandemic, that would have been a higher bar. 
Then our existing businesses' uh, overheads increased by 0.7 million. We didn't have a lot of time there to react to the pandemic and cut costs, but we were already in April using the, the government's furlough scheme and in uh, and uh, the board taking salary cuts. So so that was slightly reduced by those cost actions. So we finished the year with a adjusted profit before tax of 4.3 million, which was seen as 44% above previous year. I'm going to move on to slide 14, which is the balance sheet. Plenty of detail, obviously, in uh, in the re results announcement that we already made. Just highlighting here the debt levels on the right-hand side. So at the end of last year, we had 1.5 million of net debt. That's bank debt, less cash. By the end of this year, we've taken out a, a new amortizing facility on top of the revolving facility we already had. And we finished with a net bank bed of 4 million, so increase of 2.5 million, obviously uh, highly influenced by the acquisition of Chell Instruments in, uh, in November. But what we also did at the beginning of the impact of COVID-19, we more or less drew down all of our available facility into cash. So we had five million pounds of cash and then nine million pounds of debt. Uh, so a net, net debt of four million pounds. As it turns out, we haven't really needed that cash available because we've been generating cash you know, both in March and April and, and more or less every week since then. Cash flow has been really positive, both towards the end of last year and the beginning of this year as well. And part of that was due to the down payments received from those two COVID-related orders that Mike's already talked about, one for MPB on the flow meters and the other for attic cameras. So we've currently been receiving a lot of cash down payments from those customers, and that's uh, bolstered the bank account quite a lot since the end of the year. Also on that chart at the top right, you see the impact of uh, IFRS 16, which, which obliges us and, and everyone else to include leases, even operating leases on the balance sheet. So that uh, we now have about three million pounds of leases on the balance sheet offset with about three million pounds of fixed assets as well. I'm going to move on to slide 15, which shows a net debt bridge. And here we, this is somewhat the story that I've just shown. We started with one and a half million of net debt, very positive cash inflows. Uh, eaten up by working capital and lease payments and interest and taxes to some extent. Finally, the acquisition of Chell brought us from a, what would otherwise have been a net cash position down to net debt of five out of four million at the end of the year. On slide 16, we have the cash flow uh, lines from our cash flow statement in the accounts which we published. I won't go into any uh, particular detail here. Um, see one or two notes on the right-hand side, but nothing extremely important. Uh, there was a big increase actually in cash tax paid as well as the change in deferred tax. And this is because some of our units are moving from paying tax at the end of the year only to, to being in the, uh, the quarterly payments regime. So that's, that's meant that we're starting to pay more tax during the year. Okay, it's back to me, uh, Mike Creedon. Uh, we've always highlighted that our acquisition criteria within our annual report and also within our investor presentations. But this time, I'd like to expand on this area. And also, from the questions and answers coming through to us, this should answer a number of the questions coming through uh, when I actually go through this slide. Uh, why join SDI? The majority of our businesses, they all run autonomous units they still retain their independence. We want, what we want from these businesses is to grow. So therefore, SDI will actually invest in these businesses. Now we have eight businesses. We have a broad range of skills that can be shared across the group. 
our main acquisition criteria really hasn't changed from when we first uh, started the first acquisition in February 2014. And that is we're looking for scientific and digital businesses that bias towards manufacturing the products. We want a strong export in a niche sector. Also, importantly, or very importantly for me, is it has to be profitable and cash generative. A good, strong track record we would require as well, because what we're actually doing is valuing businesses on historical earnings, which I think is a different subject uh, in this uh, in this day and age, in the last uh, sort of uh, since March onwards. What we also require is a strong management team, as all the companies are run independently. There's only myself, John, and a newly appointed financial controller in the head office, so we do actually sort of clean, keep a lean business. After we acquire the businesses, the businesses are still run independently. What we actually do is, uh, in the acquisition process is we use a number of our uh, sellers, uh, historic sellers, as a reference point uh, to give some sort of comfort to the, uh, to the people coming on board. I usually visit every site every two or three weeks, so I'm always around the sites and uh, to give them sort of comfort and also they're interested in what happens within the group. And that's and that was my job is to communicate that across the group. We discuss how we are able to grow the business in the medium to long term. And if there is investment required, then we'll get that investment. We do have strategy days in the group where we all sit around the table, all business units, discuss how we can actually grow these indiv individual business units. The central functions we provide at head office are actually quite small. They're the banking, insurance, and also use of a third party HR results. And uh, that's uh, through that slide. And then we can just go to the last page, which really is a summary. Uh, FY 2020, uh, this was a very good 12 months. We had a, a cracking 12 months of the year. And then the unexpected happened in March with the pandemic. And like the majority of the businesses, it was a period of survival for those businesses. But we thought initially it was a cash burn. But as I said to you before, we had a 13-week rolling forecast, and we still threw cash off. But we we knew very early that we had a sound business, and therefore what we needed to do was to make sure we protect the health of our staff, as mainly we had production workers on site in all the business units, as they all remained open during lockdown. Another point uh, of worth mentioning is in November, we acquired challengements, as John's already said. A very good, strong business, and uh, it's going to slot very nicely into the uh, census and control sector. A few of the acquisitions we integrated into other businesses to reduce the costs and also to strengthen those businesses. So what we did is we bought a, an uh, we bought a business in the vacuum oven sector and water purification in Loughborough called Five Stream International. Four people were in that business, and the founders wanted to retire. So what we actually did is we brought that into Synoptics based in Cambridge. So four people left the business, we removed, we got rid of the uh, property and we've just recruited one person in, five, in, uh, in Synoptics. And what we can actually do is strengthen the marketing team behind that. The second area is we acquired applied thermal control based in Colville and we had the opportunity last year to actually acquire another business based in, in uh, Leicester called Thermal Exchange. Both chiller businesses apply thermal controllers in the life science sector and thermal exchanges in the manufacturing engineering sector. We don't cross over on the sales side, but what we actually did is we combined them into one business unit based in Power Upon Sir, and then we've actually uh, tidied up the businesses and uh, removed two of the business units. And we're just in one business unit. For financial year 2021, we are seeing signs of normal trading patterns in some of the businesses, with a good part of our sales being generated overseas, travel restrictions are having an impact on the number of the businesses. Profits in 2021 are going to be in line with 2020. There are a number of acquisitions in the pipeline, and I'm hopeful that there will be more coming through as we come out of furlough. I'd like to say thanks for that. Uh, that's the end of the presentation. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Uh, Mike, John, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, could I 
please ask you to continue to submit your questions. Uh, just to remind you, the Q&A tab is situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Um, but just while the company take a few moments uh, to review the investor questions submitted already, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your Investor Meet Company dashboard. And lastly, before I hand back to, uh, to Mike and John, I'd like to remind you that feedback is important to the company. Uh, immediately after the presentation has ended, you'll be redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. Uh, Mike, John, um, I know I haven't uh, given you a lot of time to review the questions uh, submitted today, um, but perhaps I could just hand back to you guys uh, to maybe have a little run through, um, given the time we have, and, um, and then perhaps hand back to me uh, before we wrap up. Very good, yeah. So, John here. I'm I'm going to go through the questions and, and I'll hand some of them out to Mike and some I'll attempt to, to answer myself. The first question I'm seeing on my screen uh, is from Hubert. And the question is, how likely are you to issue more shares for future acquisitions as opposed to paying for them with cash or debt instead? So I think the, the history of, of SDI Group is that back from around 2015, a couple of acquisitions were done by issuing shares. Uh, and then since then, most of the acquisitions have been done using either existing cash or increase in debt. And so in 2016, we issued shares. And then in 20, at the beginning of 2019, we issued more shares when we purchased Graticule's Optic. So in that year, 2019, we bought four companies for substantial investments and issued shares for just one of those. The rest through, uh, through increases in our debt and, and existing cash on hand. Where we sit at the, mo uh, at the moment, having purchased Chell largely through our, an increase in borrowing, is that just after the, the acquisition of Chell, we had uh, a leverage ratio, and that's measured as EBITDA to net debt, of about one. Uh, now, our bank covenants would allow us to go above that to about two times, but we feel that, roughly speaking, uh, a leverage of one is is uh, where we'd like to see it peak. So we're not really, we don't want to uh, to overexpose ourselves. We like to sleep at night. And... For the moment, we have uh, usually available to us uh, shareholders who'd like to come in. So uh, if we find that an acquisition would take our leverage much above one times, then we'd probably go to, to the equity market at some point to, to replenish the coffers. I think where we're sitting at the moment with leverage lower than one, we could do a small acquisition where by additional debt or reducing our or increasing our net debt a little bit. But if anything large came along, we might go back to the equity markets to raise some capital. Uh, so I think it does depend on the size of an acquisition and it depends on particularly where we are in terms of having paid down debt uh, from previous acquisitions. But it's likely if we can acquire as much as we'd like to, then it's likely that that would at the moment be through a mixture of both share issuance and, and increases in debt. But uh, each one will be done on its own merits. And, and you know, it's very important to us to make that decision each time we make an acquisition. So thank you for that question, Hubert. I'm going to move on to the next one from Jake, which I'll, I'll ask Mike to answer. Okay. Which is, uh, Jake, what do you look John. for in potential acquisitions and are the any new areas of interest, Mike? Okay, we'll, we'll go through that. But first of all, for us, it's to make sure it's the right call to fit uh, within the group. And uh, as I said to you before, in the acquisition process, it's got to be profitable, cash generative, have a strong local management team. That's imperative. Even if the founders are leaving, that we need to make sure that succession planning is in place, because really it's just John and I. I visit the subs, but they need to be standalone operational units. And Elsa, you say about areas, it could be, we're, we're mainly sort of dedicated to the scientific, technical, uh, manufacturing sectors. 
but all our businesses operate uh, some sort of uh, manufacturing process within those units. So I hope that's answered your question. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Then we have another question, also roughly speaking, on acquisitions and, and corporate structure from David. Does management have a maximum number of standalone operating units it would like to have, or will those units be allowed to proliferate? How autonomous are these standalone units? Again, Mike. Okay, I'll answer that. Um, when I first joined 10 years ago, I think the model I looked at, which I thought was a fantastic model, is Helmer. Helmer started like us in the 1980s, and what they did was buy businesses. Very similar to what John has actually done, it's split into sectors. So I don't think there is a maximum number of standalone units we would have, but all we'll actually do is to put them into the sectors and then you would have a tier structure underneath. So what you would have very similar to sort of Helmer would be a management structures managing the sectors. So I don't think there is a maximum number. How autonomous, all our businesses are autonomous units. They have their own CEOs, they're reporting to myself with the finance people reporting into John. They receive the same management information as, as we give out to the main board. It's quite a flat structure, and uh, it's uh, it's historically it's worked very well. So I don't see why it shouldn't continue to be. Thanks, Mike. And do you want to take the yeah. next one as well, yeah. with Jake? Which is where do you find where do you expect the greatest opportunity for growth? Uh, that's a difficult question regarding acquisition side, but. Um, uh, I think what's happened in the early days is we acquired businesses and there must have been a certain amount of financial engineering involved. But now the city requires to uh, have organic growth. And what we've been finding, uh, as you've seen through uh, John's presentation, is organic growth. A lot of our large organic growth is coming through the new businesses, i.e. the sense of the control side of the business. So that's the greatest opportunity for growth for us on the organic side. Acquisition side, it's a difficult call, really. You know, all we're making sure is, to, is when we acquire businesses, they're they're profitable, they're cash generative, and we can actually grow them. It's a, it's difficult to actually put a number on that figure. So can we move on from? Yeah. So I'm now going yeah. to uh, go to Doug D's question. What is your return on invested capital target and actual? So Doug, we um. We don't publish this. We look at return on invested capital for all of our businesses individually and also for the group as a whole. Uh, we don't publish the number because it tends to fluctuate and it fluctuates uh, within the businesses and, and for SDI group as a whole. Uh, but uh, if you like, the, the kind of return we're looking at is above 20%. And Really, that's related to the kind of multiples we're paying for acquisitions. Mike uh, told you earlier on that, that we look to buy acquisitions at a fair price, fair, fair for both seller and buyer, and that's typically been at four to six times EBIT. And if you're making acquisitions at that kind of rate, and with a little bit of growth after you've purchased them, then you can see that above 20% is, is quite feasible, and that's what we're actually doing. Um, Another question now from Jonathan B, which is, do you have any, any intention to start paying a dividend in the future? And I'll let Mike answer that one. Yeah, we've had that. If you have a look at, I think it was a 2007 or 2008 uh, annual report, uh, we did say we'd love to pay, pay a, a dividend. Uh, I would do because I'm a shareholder as well. But what uh, a lot of our investors have actually said, and I did actually raise it to a share society, and I did raise the question there, is if we can actually buy uh, businesses with the money, then we can create shareholder wealth. But if I can't purchase any acquisitions, then that money, rightly, rightly so, should go back to the shareholders as it's their business. So I think that answers your question. Okay, good. Thanks, Mike. Uh, now... Um, and some more acquisition related yeah. uh, questions. So from okay. Jonathan H, what acquisition opportunities have arisen recently? And then linked to that is a question from Nick J, which is, is the current environment accelerating the acquisition opportunities you're looking at? Okay, I'll answer that if you like. Um, well, we have a pipeline now of acquisitions. It, uh, of course, it's slowed down because people, you, you can't uh, meet people face-to-face. -face. So we've had a number of Zoom meetings, but they're just initial meetings. 
um, to go through the acquisition process, we really need to visit the site and kick the tires and make sure it's a it's a proper company. And also, when you actually do due diligence, you need to be on site just to check one the financials, but two the staffing and, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so it's been difficult, but it's pleasing to know that I'm actually back out on the road with my chairman next week, looking at uh, acquisition opportunities. In this current environment, yes, it's slow, but personally, uh, I actually think uh, quite a few acquisitions will start coming through soon as furlough ends, because people are actually going to look at their businesses, they've got to bring people back on onto the books, and you look at an aging uh, seller, thinking, do I want to go through this again if there's a second spike? So I'm hoping that uh, we'll get a few opportunities coming through uh, towards the back end of the year. Thanks, Mike. So uh, next question from Robert B. And he asks, will any future issue of shares be available to existing shareholders as well as institutional investors? And this is a question that, that typically does come up when we meet with uh, retail shareholders. I think the answer is this. I, I would say that we typically issue shares when we're doing an acquisition, and it's very difficult to to do that acquisition and raise the funds um, from all shareholders at the same time and still satisfy the need of the seller to make a, a, a sale within a, a short period of time. So we find it hard to do that on the right timetable and, uh, and with the, the, the right certainty, if you like, of outcome for the seller. What we did in our last uh, capital raise when we purchased Graticules in, in uh, February of 2019 was we allowed retail shareholders in general, but not specifically our existing shareholders, to subscribe via a primary bids platform. And that was a positive experience for us in terms of the, uh, the ease of, of doing that. So we'd certainly look to be doing that in the future, although every, again, every acquisition and every fundraising will be done on its own merits. So uh, if we really need to raise a lot of money, then obviously we would have to go to all shareholders, and, and in that case, we'd be happy to do it. But uh, I don't think we can promise to open up all of our uh, capital raises to our existing shareholders because it just wouldn't be feasible for to to make the acquisition in the time period that usually it is required. Um, so that's that question. Um, I uh, coming to the next question from Francois L regarding acquisition localization. Those have mainly been done in Britain, while there is one in USA and one in Portugal. Are overseas subsidiaries harder to manage due to the distance or not at all? Mike, do you want to go for that one? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, the, uh, the US operation wasn't an acquisition. Uh, that's a sales and marketing function uh, based in Frederick uh, with, uh, for the uh, Synoptics uh, business unit. And uh, the business unit based in Portugal, Lisbon, is a manufacturing site which we've had for a number of years. Uh, it was a, a partnership between the uh, Steve Chambers in the UK and Rui Stripper in uh, Lisbon. And then we acquired both businesses in, uh, in 2008. No, we, we would actually look uh, far and wide for acquisitions. So uh, we've actually got a few on uh, look what we're looking at overseas at the moment in Europe and uh, also the US. But there's a lot of uh, businesses in the UK, so uh, we're just taking the, an opportunity to to uh, acquire businesses locally. Uh, it saves travel time, um, and it's easy to do due, due diligence. But uh, I'm free to uh, look at any businesses. I think the problem is is with the US businesses is a uh, there's a premium on those businesses, as John rightly said. You know, we buy businesses at a fair price, UK price, of four to six times EBIT. But in the US, uh, their expectations are far higher, as I've known in the past. So, uh, like I said, I'm open to uh, businesses anywhere, but uh, I've been informed there's probably 2,000 business, businesses uh, within this sector in the UK alone, uh, which are managed by uh, families. So there's no reason why I uh, should go further, further afield yet. But uh, if there's an opening, 
uh, within the rest of the world, I'm happy to uh, to visit that. Thanks, Mike. And then, then finally at the bottom, I have a question from Jonathan H, uh, which is how much competition is there to acquire your target business? It's a good question. Is that me? Mike, that's one for you again. Thank you, my friend. Um, we, uh, we actually try to capture the businesses in the early stages. So there, there's a lot of hand holding and it could take uh, a number of years before we acquire these businesses. So uh, we don't actually get in a bidding war apart from uh, one, which was uh, made known in the broker's notes uh, for Chellin uh, Instruments. But uh, there was 10 parties uh, interested in that business, of which seven were private equity, which is a, a well-known fact, and three trade. And we just come out to, to be the preferred uh, acquirer. So uh, that's the only one. And uh, you know, hopefully we don't want to get into a bidding war, but I'm sure we will do as we start growing. But uh, we know what our uh, fair price is, and uh, we have to make sure that when we acquire businesses, it's within those uh, price parameters. But I'm sure as we get bigger, you know, the numbers get bigger, the profitability gets bigger, and uh, the uh, the price expectations P uh, gets bigger as well. Thank you, John. Th thank you very much. I, I think you've you've gone through most of the questions that have uh, been submitted today, um, and of course, uh, if there are any that uh, that we haven't uh, got through, obviously the company will review all questions submitted today, and of course, publish responses uh, where it's appropriate to do so. Um, I guess, uh, Mike, John, before before we uh, wrap up, because I know you want feedback from investors, and we'll redirect them. Um, just if you just want to wrap up, and then I'll take back and direct the investors to give feedback thank you okay uh sort of very uh, quickly it, it, this has been a, sort of a, a nice uh, introduction i think all our investor presentations this week have been via this uh, sort of media but for me personally i still i think it's a good media going forward but i still like to go to share sock and to mellow uh, meeting face to face so i think it's going to be a mixture of both going forward you know, as i said to you before we're a buy and build business we're still on the acquisition trail so I don't see any reason why this uh, this shouldn't change. So uh, I think that's, that's thank you, and um, John, thank you as well, um, and uh, also Mike for updating investors today as part of your roadshow. Um, could I ask investors not to close this session as you'll be automatically redirected um, to give feedback. If you access this meeting from our website, the feedback form will appear. And if you accessed it via a link in the email, uh, then we would ask you to simply log back in. You'll be asked to log back in. And as I say, if you could provide the company with feedback, I'm sure they'd be very appreciative. On behalf of the company, uh, of SDI Group, of John and Mike, and Investor Meet Company, I'd like to thank you for attending today. Um, that now concludes today's session. Thank you once again for attending.